I can cluster them under two headings. One is this parasympathetic paragangliomas, which will present a little different. And second one is the pheochromocytoma and sympathetic paragangliomas, which are nothing but chromaffin cell tumors. Chromaffin cell tumors of the adrenal medulla are called pheochromocytomas, and chromaffin cell tumors of the uh, extra adrenal sites are called as sympathetic paragangliomas. Remember, this parasympathetic paragangliomas generally tend to be non-functional, which means they do not secrete catecholamines predominantly. And uh, at the same time, they tend to be non-malignant as well. Usually, they will present uh, due to either enlarging size of the tumor, which might appear to the patient as something is wrong, or they might be presenting with a mass effect because of the tumor. So they don't present with any uh, symptoms that are related to catecholamine excess. So the first and most important tumor is the carotid body tumor or a carotid body paraganglioma, which is the most common parasympathetic paraganglioma in the world. So this carotid body tumor is more described in surgical textbooks, but still anyways, it can present like a slow, enlarging, painless mass in the lateral aspect of the neck. Slow, enlarging and painless mass in the lateral aspect of the neck, especially below the angle of the jaw. So that is where they tend to develop. Remember, this carotid body tumors generally happen at increased incidence in patients who are living at high altitudes. Increased incidence with patients who are living at high altitudes. That is naturally expected because the carotid body acts as a chemoreceptor. So chronic hypoxia in high altitude may lead to development of tumor in that area. That is explainable, but why this High altitude related carotid body tumor happens particularly in females, we don't know. So that's, they have a tremendous predisposition, especially this female gender to this carotid body tumor, especially if they live at high altitude. Apart from that, this can happen at sea level also, but high altitude people are more predisposed to develop this carotid body tumor. Usually, uh, they will be coming just with the swelling only, but they might have dysphagia additionally, if they have mass effect, or they may have additionally this cranial nerve palsies, if at all the mass effect is severe, especially these cranial nerves uh, that are seen in that area like this 9, 10, 11, 12 and very rarely even 7th cranial nerve can be affected. Clear? At the same time, they can result in Horner's syndrome, even though rare it must be a big mass to produce Horner's syndrome. Many of the times they may show a bruit and pulsatability because of the underlying carotid artery and they might exhibit this positive Fontaine sign. So what do you mean by this Fontaine sign? The tumor tends to move freely in the horizontal direction then compared to the vertical direction. So this is what we refer to as Fontaine sign of the carotid body tumor. And second tumor is the jugulotympanic paraganglioma, previously referred to as glomus jugulare, uh, which is uh, more described in the ENT textbooks. So one of the important differential diagnosis for middle ear tumor. Usually they are present with a slow growing mass near the middle ear and they tend to produce this pulsatile tinnitus, very important differential diagnosis for pulsatile tinnitus. Very important characteristic feature of this jugulotympanic paragangloma is the erosions that they produce. They produce erosions of the temporal bone. Uh, that the skull based erosions at the same time they can produce this ear ossicles erosions also that's a very characteristic feature which is not seen in other tumors in the same area so these are the two important parasympathetic paragangliomas that you have to know but remember this pheochromocytomas and sympathetic paragangliomas tend to behave differently because they tend to be more functional which means they produce symptoms due to excessive catecholamines which means they are rarely non-functional at the same time there is a slightly increased chance of malignancy compared to parasympathetic paragangloma. So usually they will present due to symptoms of excessive catecholamines only. And this high catecholamines, we know what symptoms they are going to produce, but uh, with regards to this functioning pheoparaganglioma, this becomes very important to understand. So this high catecholamines in functioning pheoparaganglioma is going to produce a classic constellation of symptoms referred to as classic six Ps. The first P I'm going to talk is about the pressure, that is the elevated blood pressure. So this elevated BP is the most common 
sign in a patient with a functioning pio para ganglioma and this high bp can either be paroxysmal which is the commonest form in approximately 50 to 60 percentage of the patients approximately 30 to 40 percentage of the patients they may even have a sustained elevation of the blood pressure so which means the traditional belief that pheochromocytomas and uh, paragangliomas cause only paroxysmal spikes in blood pressure is wrong so they can even have a sustained elevation in the blood pressure and resistant hypertension in 40 percentage of the cases remaining 10 percentage may have a normal bp because i told you already 10 percentage will be non-secretory and they will not produce catecholamine so that's the reason why they can have a normal bp also with respect to pheochromocytoma remember we don't have sufficient data for paraganglomas but with respect to pheochromocytomas this will definitely uh, apply well and that is the reason one more rule of 10 you can remember that 10 percent will have a normal bp already we have, we know different rules of 10 10 percent will be extraordinal 10 percent will be malignant 10 percent will be bilateral 10 percent will show calcifications 10 percent will present in pediatric population 10 percent will be familial that means is associated with genetic mutations 10 percent will not secrete catecholamines 10 percent will be diagnosed as incidentalomas adrenal incidentalomas and 10 percent will have normal catecholamine and they don't secrete catecholamines and 10 percent will have normal bp so these are the different rules of tens but these are not important for the exams to be honest that's only for trivial purpose only for your own personal happiness you need to remember this rule of 10 but apart from that there is absolutely no importance about this rules of tens to be honest so what is the index case regarding this paroxysmal spikes in the blood pressure so he's a big vip that's an index case actually that's worth mentioning so since he is a very big VIP, his BP was routinely measured for months and years. So initially his BP was okay, but one fine day he started developing this sudden increase in the BP. Like for example, he got a BP of 250, 150, just arbitrarily I'm telling. So it was stable for a small period of time. Then once again, he used to develop a BP of maybe uh, 200 bar 140. And once again, he developed a BP spike of 300 bar 200. So similarly, these kind of spikes continued and there are some episodes of hypotension also, especially while standing. So similarly, he had different, different spikes like this and one fine day he died. And when they autopsy it after his death, because he's a big VAP and they didn't properly understand the cause of this elevation of BP and death, they found out there was a 2.5 centimeter pheochromocytoma in the right adrenal gland. And the cause of death is myocardial infarction. This gives a vital clue. Once, I mean, one thing that it tells is about regarding the paroxysmal spikes in the BP. Second thing it tells you that most common cause of pheochromocytoma, death in pheochromocytoma is a cardiovascular death, that is myocardial infarction. Like this VIP died, majority of the patients with pheochromocytoma and a functioning pheoparaganglioma is going to die of a cardiovascular death only. So who is this VIP? This VIP is none other than the 30th president of the United States. His name is Dwight L. Eisenhower. He's the one who was suffering from pheochromocytoma. He's the one who died with this pheochromocytoma. And he was the index case after which we properly understood that pheochromocytoma is going to produce this paroxysmal spikes in the BP and patients are going to die of cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction. Clear? But remember, they can have sustained elevation in the BP also. It's a misnomer that they only produce paroxysmal spikes in BP. They can have sustained elevation in the blood pressure also. That's something you have to understand for sure. And second one is the pain. Second P is the pain where they can produce headache because of high blood pressure. And this headache is supposed to be the most common symptom of a pheochromocytoma and a functioning pheoparaganglium. So headache may come isolated or it can be associated with chest pain also. This could be a cardiac event also. Chest pain is again due to high blood pressure, but it can be a cardiac event also. You have to rule out cardiac event, especially in the setting of a functioning pheoparaganglioma. Number three, you can have this perspiration. Here perspiration means excessive sweating. You should not call this a sweating because they literally produce drenching. The patient will be completely drenched with sweat, especially during a paroxysmal episode. They will be completely covered with sweat the dresses will be completely filled with sweat only and this three constellation of symptoms that happens paroxysmally especially this headache elevated blood pressure and uh, drenching so this 
if it happens suddenly, we call them as FIO crisis or a FIO spell. FIO spell, clear? Very, very important. And there are a lot of important precipitating factors for developing this FIO spell. Remember, even though this is classic for a FIO chromocytoma and uh, any functioning FIO paraganglioma, but this is not either sensitive or specific for the disease. Remember why it is not sensitive because the word if I use classic, it will be seen only in less than 20% case of case in medicine. So definitely it is not uh, sensitive finding also, which means it's not seen in all the patients. Less than 20% of the patients only will have this classic FIO spell as a presenting symptom. And similarly, this can present in other conditions also. Like for example, very commonly it can even have in a patient with a panic attack. So this is not very specific for a functioning FIO paraganglion. But still you have to have a high index of suspicion when the patient presents with these symptoms. And what are the precipitators of FIO spell? This is even more important because if you have precipitators and then if you develop this uh, kind of uh, spells, that is more specific for a functioning FIO paraganglioma and a catecholamine excess. And the most important precipitator, as far as I know, is the beta blockers, which is very important for exams because giving beta blockers may precipitate a FIO spell. The reason is very simple. You have two receptors that are present in the vessels which are acted upon by the catecholamines, your adrenaline and noradrenaline. Adrenaline has good effect on both alpha and beta 2, but as noradrenaline has more effect on alpha one with respect to the beta 2. So this alpha one is going to produce vasoconstriction and beta 2 we know it's going to produce vasodilation. Now when you give a beta blocker, now this catecholamines action will be completely directed towards this alpha 1 receptors producing more and more vasoconstriction because they cannot act on beta 2 receptors now and uh, this will precipitate a FIO spell and uh, this is due to unopposed alpha action by the catecholamine. So this is something very important to know, especially for exams. In exams, whenever they tell the patient's BP is getting worsened after giving beta blockers, think about FIO chromocytoma and MAV inhibitors. Even though rarely given nowadays, but MAV inhibitors can reduce the metabolism of catecholamines because of that there can be high level of catecholamines. Uh, so MAV inhibitors can precipitate a FIO crisis. So whenever you increase the intraabdominal pressure, because you are increasing the intraabdominal pressure, the tumor might regurgitate more and more catecholamines resulting in a FIO crisis. Example is pregnancy or any abdominal manipulation like examination of the abdomen. Procedures like colonoscopy or any surgery, especially intraabdominal surgery, can result in precipitation of a spell. Third one, if you are doing an FNA, never ever do a FNA for a suspected pheochromocytoma or a suspected adrenal incidentaloma unless and until you have some specific indication. So you have to be very scared of doing this FNA, especially if you are suspecting a pheochromocytoma because there are a lot of reasons why FNA is dangerous in pheochromocytoma. Because when you do an FNA, obviously the tumor will regurgitate, will explode and they produce more and more catecholamines. And it is like uh, putting a nuclear weapon on a already guzzling volcano. And it's like the volcano will explode, the mountain will explode and you are going to result in death on table. So don't do that. And second thing, because of the local release of catecholamines, there will be a lot of fibrosis and surgery becomes very difficult. And histopathology also becomes uh, very difficult to interpret because of fibrosis because of the uh, FNAC. So for many reasons, you should not do FNAC in a suspected patient with a FIO paraganglioma. Very, very important point. And FNA can precipitate a crisis and death on table. Be very wary about that. And finally, radio contrast agents, especially this ironated radio contrast agents are theoretically thought to be one of the reasons for precipitation of this FIO spell. But to be honest, right now, this radio contrast agents are not thought to be the reason for FIO crisis, practically speaking, they don't induce any FIO crisis. I mean, for that matters, we do contrast CTs very routinely for diagnosis of FIO chromocytoma. They do not induce uh, FIO crisis. Only in theory, they can induce a FIO crisis under FIO spell. So this is something very important for exams. And fourth P, which you have not completed yet, is the pallor or a vasoconstrictive spell. So especially when a patient is having high blood pressure with very cold peripheries, and pale person. So usually it goes towards catecholamine excess. In this regards, it goes towards the functioning pheoparaganglioma. And fifth one is the palpitations. 
This is very important because even though you might not uh, give importance to this, but these palpitations are important in the sense like most common cause of death in pheochromocytoma patients is cardiac death. So that is the reason why palpitations has to be controlled. And final sixth P is the postural hypotension or orthostatic hypotension. Postural or orthostatic hypotension, why this is important and why patients with pheochromocytoma or any functioning pheoparagangloma should develop this postural hypotension or orthostatic hypotension in the first place. For that you have to understand what is the role of this sympathetic nervous system in preventing this postural fall in the BP. So whenever you are going to stand up, stand erect, so your blood will pull into the periphery, blood will pull into the legs and uh, your sympathetic nervous system will immediately get activated because they will sense the loss of volume and there will be more noradrenaline and adrenaline release, especially noradrenaline. They will act on the alpha receptors in the veins of the lower limb where they will constrict the veins of the lower limb and uh, they will push the blood back into the systemic circulation and central circulation resulting in prevention of this orthostatic hypotension. But whenever you are having uh, a continuous exposure to catecholamines, like in a case of a functioning pheoparagangloma, the receptors will go for down regulation and this process is what we refer to as tachyphylaxis. Because of the down regulation of the receptors, next time when the patient stands up, the blood will pool in the periphery, that will be sensed by the system and they will release more and more catecholamines, but there will be no receptors to act upon, resulting in poor venoconstriction in the lower limbs, resulting in continuous pooling of the blood and uh, return to the central circulation is less resulting in orthostatic hypotension, which means the explanation for this postural hypotension is the tachyphylaxis of the receptor, so the down regulation of the receptors in the lower limbs because of continuous exposure to catecholamines. These are six classic pieces that you have to know. Apart from that, these excessive catecholamines can result in other problems like uh, weight loss, hyperglycemia, and they can produce tremors, and they can produce constipation as well. So remember many students believe it's diarrhea, no it is constipation because sympathetic excess will result in constipation only and not diarrhea. Only parasympathetic excess will result in diarrhea. And weight loss and glucose uh, excess can be explained very easily because catecholamines, we know the name suggests they are catabolic. Catabolic in the sense they will convert this muscle proteins to amino acids, especially alanine will be released into the circulation, this amino acids will enter gluconeogenesis. That is the main function of catecholamines, especially during fright, flight and fight reaction, you need more glucose, they break down the muscles and uh, produce more amino acids and they will be shunted towards gluconeogenesis and this is going to produce excessive glucose. This is okay if you have a uh, some flight, fright and fight reaction going on, but when there is continuous exposure to catecholamines, Pathologically, there will be continuous catabolic state going on, continuous breakdown of proteins resulting in weight loss and continuous production of glucose resulting in hyperglycemia. One of the important endocrine causes of hyperglycemia is pheochromocytoma and uh, any other functioning pheoparagangloma for that matters. So clear? So this is a very important point to understand again. Apart from that, pheochromocytoma can result in multiple paraneoplastic syndromes. They can produce excessive erythropoietin resulting in polycythemia, they can result in excessive calcium that is due to excessive production of PTH related peptide that produces hypercalcemia, they may produce growth hormone releasing hormone excess, GHRH excess or they may even produce ACTH excess very rarely but these are very very rare. But hypercalcemia can happen in a patient with a functioning pheoparagangloma especially a pheochromocytoma. So we have understood the clinical features of uh, pheoparagangloma, especially the functioning part. Subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from PrepLadder.